Welcome back, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. And, and one of the things, you know, the greatest thing about IoT Live, in, in my opinion, is that it's completely free and it's completely virtual. So, you know, whether you're in an office building, laying on a hammock on a beach, or driving a car down the road, there's actually a way that you can tune in. Um, so we thank everybody who is tuning in and, and can't, uh, you know, believe that the support we've had from the IoT community on this. Um, you know, we've had hundreds of people already visit this morning on the site and, and viewing and, and listening. Um, and so uh, now we're going to actually turn it over to the, you know, lunch if you're on the East Coast section of the, the uh, agenda. And we have a keynote. Um, but first, before I introduce uh, Kevin, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, ThingWorks. ThingWorks is a PTC business. And really what they get down to is they provide an application platform and development tools um, with, with you know an advanced cloud-based service and software for managing connected products and machines. And one of the things that I think separates ThingWorks, and this is kind of Harbor's view, is that ThingWorks was one of the pioneers in understanding um, how to work and develop application development tools around heavy CapEx equipment. So whether it be uh, large equipment in a, in a hospital, large equipment in a manufacturing facility, ThingWorks is really leading the way in the IoT of, of getting those devices connected and then helping and managing them and developing the tools to do so. They have a huge ecosystem of partners, and I'm sure Kevin will touch on some of that. But um, with no further ado, I want to introduce Kevin Holbrook. He's the uh, Partner uh, Technology Strategy Senior Director at ThingWorks, a PTC business. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to him at, at this time. Perfect. So thank you for the fantastic introduction. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. All right. So, um, you know, great setup uh, for the perspective that we have on IoT here. Uh, so, I have a uh, keynote style presentation prepared. Um, there will be a question and answer period following. So, if there's anything I say that uh, interests you, if you're interested about PTC, um, <clears throat> IoT, any of the user stories that uh, we're going to talk about today, feel free to reach out afterwards. I'll stick around and answer questions. Um, and at the end, I give my uh, Twitter handle in the event that anybody wants to reach out. So the theme we picked for today's keynote uh, was back to the future with IoT. So we're sitting here in 2015. Um, we're sort of on the cusp, uh, as many media outlets will tell you, of this connected revolution where uh, connected homes, smart cities, smart agriculture, you know, the whole world is becoming connected and a much stronger place as a result of it. Uh, so we thought we'd uh, take a look at where we are now, um, you know, where we were uh, 30 years ago and how we envisioned 2015 to be, and then talk a bit about how we see the future from our standpoint now. And basically, we're here because of two things, uh, ubiquitous electrons and ubiquitous Wi-Fi um, and, uh, and cell connectivity. So when you combine those two things, the idea that power is everywhere and the idea that connectivity is accessible from almost anywhere, <clears throat> you sort of open up a whole new uh, series of possibilities. Now, uh, in the presentation today, we'll talk about where we came from, what we think the future is going to look like. We'll talk about whether or not the technology is ready. There's a lot of doubters out there. So uh, I try to keep my finger on the pulse of the IoT community. And there is certainly a lot of noise that gets made. Um, about uh, security fears and about a lack of standardization. So we'll talk a little bit about whether or not the technology we have today is sufficient for us to truly change the world and create this, uh, you know, sort of panacea of uh, IoT. And then, of course, uh, you know, I am from uh, ThingWorks and PDC, formerly from Exceda, uh, here via acquisition last fall. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we look at IoT, and I'm going to talk about some real-world IoT solutions. I think, uh, and honestly, some of the best ways to inspire people uh, are to communicate these actual current success stories that are going on in IoT. Uh, <clears throat> so first, let's go back, pop in the DeLorean, take a look at what things looked like 30 years ago. Uh, so I had either the fortune or misfortune of, of being around um, and active 30 years ago. Um, we're talking pre-internet days, so 1985's pre-internet days. So uh, internet effectively becomes commercially available in 92, 93. So what were we talking about back then? We certainly weren't talking about IoT. We hadn't met the computing requirements and certainly hadn't met the connectivity requirements. Um, so we were talking about, you know, is Lotus 1, 2, 3 going to be the winner? Um, is the IBM PC standard going to make it? Um, you know, a lot of talks about how things are physically laid out, the idea that uh, you could have concurrent uh, operating systems running. And uh, moving forward, we started to talk a little bit about uh, communicating, you know, so the modem community, um, 
and we had the advent of, of you know advanced robotics. So a lot of fear and FUD around whether your job was going to be replaced by that of a robot. Um, and in some dangerous and medial repetitive situations, absolutely it has been. Um, and probably to the betterment of all as opposed to the detriment. But there was legitimate fear there. Uh, <clears throat> and on the communication side, uh, it was ludicrous. So I, back in the day, was you know on my 1040, my Atari 1040 ST, I was connecting to BBSs and I was downloading games and low resolution images and, um, and uh, you know, sharing all kinds of information at an exceedingly slow rate, a painfully slow rate uh, with my fellow BBS members. But we thought it was unbelievably cool. We look back and laugh and say that for 400 bucks you could have a 1200 bit per second modem. Um, but that was fantastic at the time. Uh, you know, I could remotely dial into somebody else's computer and share content. Um, it was remarkable. But when we look back now from our perspective, our, our future perspective, um, relative future anyway, we laugh at this and say, oh my goodness, you know, I can't believe, you know, a 20 megabyte hard drive could have cost you $600 and could have been as large as, you know, the first SunSpark server. Um, it, it's ludicrous to us because of how small and how ubiquitous uh, things like storage and things like connectivity have become. So the big question is, you know, what does the future hold for us? So in 1985, uh, we had a fantastic vision of the future, and I feel slightly shortchanged in that I do not own a hoverboard um, nor a hover car in any capacity. Uh, but we missed some key things. There were, um, you know, no real discussions about uh, whether or not we would carry a device in our pocket, which we mistakenly call a phone, um, that would let us see a picture of our house from space or give us directions to get there from nearly any place on the planet. Um, or that I'd be able to share an image of, if there were a hoverboard, let's say a hoverboard, um, with everybody on the planet, certainly with my circle of friends, and it could go viral and have millions of people talking about it um, before I was able to get home that day. So the connected world that arose was far different than the connected future we talked about, So, or the, the future we talked about back in 85. So rolling the clock forward 30 years, it's interesting to think about how the world might change. You know, some ideas that we came up with when throwing this together, um, the advent of ambient computing, the idea that, uh, you, you know, computing is happening everywhere. Um, it happens uh, right now primarily in my pocket and then on my desk. Um, but there is certainly, you know, with miniaturization, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, things have changed. It, it's possible to pack massive computational ability into tiny, tiny devices. Um, with the uh, onset of now flexible um, LED uh, displays, it's possible to have all kinds of advances in wearables and um, technology in places that you wouldn't normally think it. Now, it may not be that um, we have a self-drying jacket, as they predicted in Back to the Future, um, but uh, you know we may have the ability to certainly know um, everywhere that uh, the jacket was manufactured that the equipment was monitored and managed by IoT, that the shipments were optimized by IoT, and I can begin to interact with the environment around me due to some sort of ambient computing. And the idea that everything will be connected, if we go back and look at that modem, uh, you know, a boxy, nasty desktop modem <clears throat> trying to get us all the way up to 1,200 baud's, wouldn't be feasible to connect small things. Certainly no one would think about connecting devices that they wore on their uh, arm. You know, there'd be no thought there. So uh, nano connectivity, the idea that you can connect with low power using things like Zigbee, um, Bluetooth LE doesn't take that much power. Um, connect to uh, spots that will give you broader connectivity is probably one of the biggest fields that's going to open. And then the ubiquitous wireless space. So um, Wi-Fi became uh, available in about 2000. So um, before that, everything was, was landlines. Of course, we had cellular, but didn't have 3G yet. And the advent of wireless was huge because now you could, at least within an office space or a home space, you could connect as many things as you wanted. Um, and you could walk around. They could be mobile. It could be a laptop. It could be a phone. Um, when you go in, you know, we go into a restaurant. Um, my kids, they, they don't say, hey, do they have chicken nuggets? They say, hey, do they have Wi-Fi? Uh, because we've sort of assumed that there's this ubiquitous uh, connectivity available. Well, outside of the restaurants, and when you're walking down the street itself, you're sort of right now resigned to cellular, uh, or in really drastic cases, uh, satellite. There's been a lot of um, noise made, you know, Sigfox is a good example, in the sub-gigahertz wireless bands. And the idea that these bands could be used to provide relatively low power 
um, Wi-Fi style connectivity to devices over long, long ranges. So we're um, thinking that in the future, this uh, Wi-Fi connectivity won't be bound to hotspots that eventually, you know, hit a landline inside a, a movie theater or a cafe. But instead, the uh, Wi-Fi will just be available uh, in an ambient fashion. And also right now, one thing we see, like, you know, you go into, um, let's say, uh, Home Depot and you're buying yourself a thermostat. Certainly you have Nest as an option um, and you have uh, the Honeywell option, but you're paying a premium for a smart product. So you're taking a device that would ordinarily cost you $50 to $100 and you're more than doubling the cost so that you can have a smart version of the product. So we envision that this uh, ceases to be a differentiator within the next five or, or not not even five, maybe three years of momentum in the marketplace. We're going to see things shift from um, having a, a 2x cost smart version of something uh, to in fact having a free expectation uh, of uh, some sort of interactivity or connectivity with that device or else you'll be you know, completely without one of these standard features. And the other one, and this is huge, and I don't know anybody who's currently positioned to make uh, serious inroads here, the idea of democratized data. There's a book I read not too long ago called Code Halos, which is a fantastic book that sort of talks about the clouds of information that we generate, devices generate, people generate, um, and how you can leverage those clouds of information, those halos of information, um, to offer better services, to find value adds, and to create entirely new offerings that you wouldn't have had previously. What's interesting is that now that we're generating all this data, um, we are starting to become self-aware from a data perspective that this data is valuable and that I may not want everybody in the universe to have access to it. So we're thinking that things will shift a little bit more toward an idea of having some degree of control over the data sets that we generate. But, of course, this is our view, and just like when we looked at uh, 1985's perspective of 2015, the hoverboards, the self-drying jackets, um, the holograms, um, what will 2045 look back at and laugh at uh, from our perspective. So would it be our lack of standards? And this is, a, this is an anecdote I have to tell. So um, if you'd asked me two years ago and you'd said what the biggest problem was, I've been in IoT for about seven years now, um, and you said what's the biggest problem facing IoT today, I would have said standards, we need standards. It's a lack of standards that's preventing adoption. What I've noticed, however, um, and I'll tell you an Exceda story, was that we had you know, most of the medical device manufacturers and you could go into an operating room and you could conceivably be sitting there in front of three different machines that were connected to, at the time, the Exceda Cloud, now ThingWorks. Um, and they were using the same protocol, a proprietary XML-based protocol called eMessage. They were running, you know, relatively similar and compatible versions of Edge software. And up in the cloud, they were going to an identical set of services hosted in the same data center in Waltham, Massachusetts. So from a standards perspective, we have erased all boundaries, right? We're at the panacea, three devices in an operating room speaking every way possible the exact same dialects. And yet, one could not create a dashboard that had all three of those devices on it. And the reason was commercial. So it's not just a... a technical problem to get those data sets to align is also a commercial problem. Each one of those manufacturers paid good solid money to get that device connected and the idea that they would then yield this data to some other vendor was anathema um, to them. It was not something they were going to go down because effectively it was eroding their position in the market. So this is one of the biggest challenges I think they'll look back at and laugh um, because there's uh, commercial models getting in the way of successful um, IoT deployments. So they probably will get a good chuckle knowing that we had devices sitting next to each other that in all intents and purposes could communicate with one another, but in practicality they had no way to do so. Um, they also will probably laugh at, at the thing part of IoT. So this always gets me. So I was out of Dreamforce back in um, October of last year, um, and we were in the IoT section. And I would say that there were probably a half dozen companies there that were truly IoT. Uh, there was some fleet management, the telemetry guys were there, the ARM guys were there. Um, we had a booth, so there was definitely a presence of IoT folks, but then there was a whole bunch of what I would just call T, just connected things, silly connected things. Um, you know, we read announcements of people doing connected toothbrushes, uh, we hear people doing, uh, you know, connected um, egg crate or egg carton for inside your fridge to tell you when you're out of eggs. Um, these are neat, 
but these probably aren't going to have any real long-standing traction. There haven't been many huge um, advances in the toothbrush market, um, so that is why that you know it is so commoditized. And I don't think that um, you know, 30 years from now, people will look back and say, "Man, 2015—that's the year we got our first connected toothbrush. That right there was the apex of human civilization." So they'll look back, they'll look back and get a bit of a chuckle from the stuff we've done. Maybe the thing they'll laugh and most fairly laugh at would be our hesitance. Uh, so there is an institutional hesitance uh, to start connecting devices because of security fears. Um, also, it costs money. So let's take a look at a white goods manufacturer, like somebody like a Maytag or an Electrolux. Um, they manufacture a device. To connect that device is not trivial. It's going to cost them, you know, from our experience, between $7 and, and $15 per unit uh, to put a piece of hardware on there that's capable of communicating out to the Internet. And then you have to aim it somewhere. It's a stream of data. Where are you pointing it? Where's that data going? Someone has to receive the data, store the data, allow you to come back and get the data, and do so in a way that um, allows you to have secure access and visibility rights. So uh, we are currently facing a good degree of institutional hesitance, uh, and people feel more likely to go it alone or build some proprietary solution, which even further hinders interoperability. And I'll tell you, at the beginning of the Internet, um, we had agreed upon a subset um, of protocols that we would all talk. So there was going to be TCP, there was going to be IP, which meant you could identify a server somewhere. We added DNS so that you could give it a nice, happy, friendly name. Um, on top of that, we said HTTP will be an application layer protocol, so you'll know how to go and reach out and ask for hypertext resources on another machine. Um, and then we added HTML, which was a standard for the content uh, communicated between these two nodes. Um, had we approached IoT perhaps less organically and in a little more structured fashion, uh, we probably would have compatibility already uh, in the bag by now. Uh, <clears throat> but let's address the present time in a bit more detail. So we want to succeed. We want IoT to happen. Everybody's here. We're excited about it. We've already got teasers that are deploying in the marketplace, probably more than you know. But what's in our way? What really prevents us from being successful? Um, what's the buzz right now? What is everybody talking about in this space? Um, what are they actually doing in this space? Because you'll find those two in practice are not the same thing. And then, um, of course, you know we're here as a, a sponsor. I'm going to tell you what PTC ThingWorks is doing about it. Here's the vision slide that we tend to throw out there. Uh, the idea, everybody has different numbers, and it seems that analysts make a you know part of their living anyway, looking at numbers of other um, reports and then increasing the numbers to get a slightly bigger uh, splash. Right now, there are about you know there were one billion connected sensors, devices, machines on the planet. Um, we're scaling well. I'm not sure that we're going to hit the 2020 target of 50 billion, but it's entirely possible. Certainly, if you consider every mobile handset a potential connected device, then you're probably going to get there pretty quickly because I think that gives you like five billion off the top. Um, but add in all the other little sensors that need to be there. Anything that's connected um, to a machine or is providing data up into the cloud. Um, is part of that 50 billion number. And from that perspective, you're going to have a whole lot of applications to address these. Now, don't fall into the trap where you think that an application simply means um, an HTML or native iOS, Android um, application. Um, an application could be something that lives only in the back end, that lives only at the edge and serves to be the front end to the physical device you're interfacing with. So we see as this number of devices increases, so logically must the number of applications which are deployed. Again, deployed at the edge, deployed in the cloud, um, or existing as glue between different pieces of the stack. And as this begins to balloon, and we talk about one trillion, although I think that's a bit of an analyst over projection, um, but uh, even if we were an order of magnitude less than that, my goodness, a hundred billion devices, there are going to be hundreds of millions of applications that need to be out there. So the IoT space is not just a matter of getting a device connected, it's certainly not just a matter of data updated down, um, but instead is a much richer landscape um, that involves us uh, not only connecting these devices, but immediately trying to get value from them. In many cases to justify the investment it took to physically connect a device. We also have a lot of FUD out there, and I'm not picking Mike out, uh, you know, as a specific um, detractor, but I respond to maybe two or three of these a week on LinkedIn. 
um, that somebody posts and says, you know, the sky is falling, um, IoT is going to allow uh, people to uh, open your garage door and rob your house. Um, it's going to allow somebody to, uh, you know, turn off your thermostat and get your pipes to burst when you're on vacation. So with each new technology advance, there's, of course, going to be um, risks there. The lack of standards doesn't help because everybody deploying their own solution, they could deploy it in their own way to greater or lesser degrees of success and to greater or lesser degrees of security. Um, and we've heard about this. We've actually heard, um, you know, I think it was uh, uh, BMW in uh, Europe that had a breach with their ability to remotely unlock doors. Um, and it came down to, and I apologize if it was another manufacturer, but I think it was those guys. It exposed um, how a poorly thought out security strategy and, you know, the exposing of a key to allow decryption um, and uh, a poor protocol handling in terms of negotiating uh, lost content uh, can lead to huge breaches. But this is true in the web. Everybody here goes and logs in and they fear for their garage door. Have you used PayPal? Yeah, it's tied into the thing that pays for the garage door, the thing that pays for the house. So we already have gone online with our most critical of systems. Um, and I think IoT, there's going to be some FUD and some real breach cases will occur. Um, if anything, we hope that that will serve to drive people toward the standards bodies and toward a consistent um, interoperability so that these can be further mitigated. So now in the marketplace, I think everybody here recognizes the Gardner hype curve. If you don't, this is a standard um, uh, analytics uh, output from the analysts, from Gartner in particular. And what they do is they take a look at uh, new technologies, and they talk about how something is invented. Everybody goes through and gets really excited and really jazzed about it, and it starts to dominate. You see it on Forbes. Um, you know, you see it all over uh, Twitter. It becomes sort of the darling of the technology market. Big data has gone through this cycle very recently. Um, then things crash because it's never as great as the media makes it out to be initially. Then you go through this depression, okay, no, it's dead. Big data's dead. Um, you know, the, the whole IAS market is, is tapped out, and IoT is never going to happen for real. And then you start to come out of that through the slope of enlightenment to the point where actually, okay, now you accept it as a technology. Everybody knows it's not the savior, but everybody knows it's necessary, and we're going to be productive with it. So right now, you can actually feel this. So there's a lot of late um, or you know new vendors coming into the space. So we feel a lot of these guys are what I'd call sticker IoT. So they'll take an existing solution and then they'll throw an IoT sticker on it and say, "Hey, I know that it only uh, you know it's a connected toaster, but uh, uh, you know it, it's an IoT toaster." So now we are part of the wave. So you get a lot of these late vendors that sort of glom onto the wave. We can see this now, which tells you that we're very close to the peak of inflated expectations, potentially even on the on the far side of it. And that it's the media that gives up first when a technology doesn't live up to its initial hype. Um, and we're seeing this with some of the IoT will never happen FUD that's going through there. Uh, and then everything settles out to reality. Um, fortunately for us, we're sort of already on the plateau of productivity, having come at this from another angle. And I'll start to talk about the success stories. Um, but the, the big statement out there, and you can tell it from the way people talk in future tense, is that IoT isn't here yet. You know, we're not ready. The chips are too expensive and they consume too much power and the battery life's not good enough for um, everything in the world to be connected. Well, things are changing in that regard. So um, this is a, an Intel Edison in the inset there. And actually, we're, we have a hackathon happening before our user conference in Boston, first weekend in May. And we're going to have people hacking on that little Edison board. So on that board right there, not only do you get a, a Quark processor that's fast, um, can run a full Linux kernel, um, you have the ability to use Bluetooth um, as a host. Um, you can be a Wi-Fi uh, client. And it's all embedded in that tiny chip whose power requirements are, are similarly tiny, 3.3 and 5 volts coming in. So <clears throat> the idea that you need massive chips and massive batteries is really a thing of the past. And I'll tell you, this is not Intel's smallest module. And this is a module. There's one step smaller. There's system on a chip, what we call the SOC market. Um, we see Broadcom, TI, uh, ARM certainly has designed a few. So a lot of people are getting in on that system on a chip market that's even smaller than this, that has no more than the standard requirements um, of a, a microprocessor. Uh, very low voltage, isn't going to take up much of a footprint. 
and yet still has astounding capabilities for processing. So I think in terms of the um, the edge technology is not ready, the connectivity technology is not ready, I think that's a falsehood. We're, we're already seeing it work now. And on the standard side, you know, right now we suffer from probably an excess of standards. Um, and, you know, if you have 50 standards, you don't have one. Um, but we're at the point now where some are starting to dominate. So JSON has become the de facto language for content uh, within IoT, whereas uh, HTML represented that for um, the, the web itself. XML is losing favor. I mean, it certainly it can be more readable than JSON in some cases. Um, it can, certainly can describe the, the content in line a little bit better. Uh, <clears throat> but we're seeing most people are doing JSON. MQTT, and I'm going to admit I've fought this for a while, um, but I'm one over now. So MQTT seems to have, um, you know, with IBM pushing it, with the Eclipse Foundation pushing it, um, everybody seems to have an adapter for it. The PubNub guys have just put in an MQTT adapter. We have an MQTT ad adapter. It seems to have taken on that sort of transport layer, that guaranteed delivery messaging layer component that um, the IoT is needed for standardization. Um, I'd also say that uh, uh, CoAP, seems to become or seems to be becoming the dominant application level protocol so sort of the HTTP equivalent um, where you can describe services and invoke them remotely so it's the uh, compact um, application protocol and it seems to be uh, picking up as the the dominant force um, I would also say that the uh, OMA guys um, with OMA's uh, they already dominate the phone provisioning space with the OMA DM standard uh, for device management, but they're now with their lightweight M to M making some noise for potentially at least um, coming in through the cellular side. It looks like it could very well be uh, the next standard. And on the actual application and deployment front, which is a, a very different ecosystem, we're now starting to see folks come up. So Nest Gadgets Defender, however, they are deliberately pushing the ecosystem play. Um, they realize everybody's got a thermostat. They're a drop-in replacement, not a new product. And as a result, they're in a perfect position to be a home gateway in the way a set-top box or a cable modem would be. Um, something that is somewhat ubiquitous and everybody has one, and you can serve now as the IoT um, gateway out to the world. And then you have people like the All Seen Alliance. Uh, <clears throat> we had one of the members of the Alliance on the uh, panel just a few minutes ago. This, for the first time, is a whole bunch of vendors getting together to say, look, we understand it's not going to be our solution that dominates IoT, so we're going to start communicating and figure out what the standards need to be and how we can interact with each other. Um, so that is a great move forward, and they've gained a lot of momentum. And, of course, Apple, and anything Apple does is going to draw users uh, simply by virtue of the uh, all the iPhones that have been deployed on the planet and all the iPad users. So uh, their home kit for a standard for smart home content is offering another avenue that would sort of get you at least into a whole bunch of standards uh, or standards compliant client devices um, in the iPhone and iPad markets. Uh, but what we're seeing here is that the standards went from the wild west of three years ago uh, to having a few clear front runners that are starting to get adoption both on the infrastructure side and on the commercial side. So I would contend that IoT is and has been here. Um, and I think I actually can go ahead and, and prove it to you in a bit. Uh, one other thing I wanted to address, though, is that we talk about IoT as if it's this whole new thing, as if it's a new, you know, just a, a new market entirely. Uh, I think that's a, a false way to look at things. So as companies began to evolve, and I'll thank Alan Smith on my team for, for giving me this um, visualization for it this morning, Initially, everybody was fighting the web. You know, ah, you don't need it. I'm not spending money on a website. We've got flyers to print. Uh, but everybody, starting in the mid-90s, had no choice. All of a sudden, URLs started appearing on commercials. Um, you know, people started to, to include it as part of their exterior presence. And it obviously became table stakes by 2000. You were nobody if you didn't have a web presence. Uh, with the advent of smartphones, the mobile piece, so m.whatever.com, um, starts to become a prevalent strategy and now you have the vertically scrolling responsive UIs that everybody's hip on. Uh, the, the idea that you have no idea how your website's going to be consumed so we're going to have to address the mobile guys and you know what we're probably going to need an app too. So uh, a lot of the customers we deal with have gone through that cycle and that evolution saying alright I've got a device that's connected to the internet yet here I'm sitting with a phone in my pocket and I can't do anything about it. 
So the mobile piece was sort of the next big wave that came up. We view IoT as nothing more than the next logical step. Um, it's not using any crazy new technology, still all TCP IP in most cases, um, in many cases HTTP. So we're using the same things, it's just a different paradigm, a different way of using things enabled uh, by the things we had talked about, the uh, rapid miniaturization and reduced power requirements for um, uh, the chips at the edge to be able to perform these, the ubiquity of connectivity, um, the fact that you can guarantee in almost any place that you would expect to be able to interact with the device, that you can interact with that device. Uh, so we see it as just that next, next evolutionary step. And the fact of the matter is, we've been doing this for a while. So I'm going to tell a few stories here. We came out of what one would think of as a remote service and uh, OEM or connected manufacturer story. So we started targeting, you know, 12, 15 people who needed to monitor largely high capex equipment um, that was deployed somewhere and that they typically had to send trucks to interface with. So we took that out of the equation and we said, okay, you need to remotely service, you need to get out and take a look at uh, equipment in the field we'll go ahead and let you monitor it. And then that started to evolve into, okay, now I've got it connected, I've got some data flowing, but my guys in the field aren't sitting at a desk, my guys in the field are, are walking around with a tablet, with a hardened tablet, or with a company issued phone in an honor box. So what we end up doing is we start shifting from that simple remote service story, that simple connected product story, to say, okay, now we're going to connect the dots and they're going to be able to see it in the context of their normal working environment. So not just somebody sitting back in a service center looking at huge screens on the wall. Uh, you have somebody who's physically in the field using a mobile device to get information about another physical device there, despite the fact that there is traffic flowing up to the cloud and flowing back down again. So for Striker, we do this um, for a variety of devices that they create. Um, mainly these things are saws, and I'm not going to tell you what they're for, but uh, you don't want to see these kind of saws. In fact, usually you'll be under anesthesia when they break these puppies out because they're terrifying. But they're precision instruments, they're extremely high cost instruments, and you do not want a battery dying when you're in the process of using one of these saws. So they have taken from a simple connected remote service all the way through, okay, now let's manage the entire life cycle of usage through an IoT connected application. Um, we're in multiple divisions of GE. So we have uh, GE Medical, we have uh, GE Oil and Gas, we have uh, um, GE Yenbacher, which is their diesel engines, um, and this is one of those engines. Of course, it goes without saying that this is a pretty high capex piece of equipment, um, and these things are massive. Now, they actually have, you know, they have their own platform, the Predix platform, which is fantastic, very advanced technology for predicting failures in equipment. They have co-resident database servers next to these things. Some of them are using SQL Server, um, but server racks basically attached to it, running massive advanced equipment. But when it came to IoT, they realized that it wasn't just a matter of turning that uh, you know, into a, a vertical versus horizontal dimension. It wasn't saying, okay, stop sending the data all to SQL Server, now we've got to send it to the cloud. Instead, it was, all right, we know that we've got all this in a local historian, and it's coming in so fast that it is not feasible or reasonable to reach out to our customer at the install base and say, yeah, you just need a dedicated T1 line outbound uh, with nothing else uh, using the traffic, and uh, we should be able to get most of your data. It's not a reasonable request of the customer. So what they've done is using our software, they've broken it down so that the key performance indicators are being sent up so that they can see when things are starting to happen that are problematic, and then the service techs can go reach out and request more information. And not necessarily information that's being sent to them directly, but information to be transferred from the co-resident database up into the cloud so that it can be analyzed by a Predix platform or other proprietary tools based on the device. So these manufacturers have been in the IoT world for a decade now, doing exactly this kind of monitoring, but enabling a completely different usage paradigm when it comes to servicing the equipment. Um, we'll also talk about Electa a little bit. So one of my favorite uh, customers, so uh, I've had a chance to visit these folks. They make the best radiotherapy machines on the planet. Uh, another machine you don't want to see in person, uh, it's a cancer treatment. But it is uh, basically a hybrid device or hybridized device consisting of a table that has sub-millimeter 
three-axis positioning control so that you can put the user in or put the uh, patient in there and get the beam to go exactly where you want to maximize hitting the uh, cancerous tissue and minimize or eliminate any of the non-cancerous tissue being hit. Now these guys had a similar problem to GE in that they generate a lot of data, man. We're talking like two billion values a month. They generate a lot of data. A lot of it stays local, but a lot of it goes up to their service center. And these guys use it to uh, predict when failures are going to happen and to proactively service these devices when they see key indicators shifting. So um, a, a great example of, uh, of a maximizing the availability of a machine, um, of course it would be terrible if a power generator goes offline. It would similarly be terrible if a radiotherapy machine goes offline. You have people who are in very strict cancer treatment regimens. Um, their health, maybe their life depends on timely treatment. Um, following through with that, that scheduled regimen. And if one of these machines is offline, um, and offline for a critical reason, you are pushing patients back and or setting them to wait for other available equipment that's on site. And the manufacturer or the, uh, the uh, end user, being the hospital in this case, um, could be losing $100,000 a day by virtue of a machine like this being offline. So they had to connect it, they did connect it, and they do monitor this data uh, flowing up through our technology. Now, there's a lot of data to be found out there, um, and a lot of people will pitch IoT as being a big data problem, and I think that it gets there, but it gets there by having um, a reasonable amount of data from a whole lot of endpoints as opposed to massive amounts of data. This is, of course, the Google Data Center. Um, we don't look to fill those pipes in IoT. Latency is real. Bandwidth consumption concerns are real. Um, if you look at a hospital environment, you have shared bandwidth. You look at a factory environment, shared bandwidth. If you look for a small portable device, you got cell bandwidth. Man, you're paying for that. You're paying as you go. Um, so you could conceivably have a, a serious cost problem just because you have a device that pings out every 10 seconds and says, I'm fine, I'm fine. Um, it's great that you're fine, but that's an expensive way to learn that you're fine. So we tend to look at the data problem as being much more a shifting of important data from place to place, uh, mainly the real-time information being the most meaningful and then shifting out when necessary to start retrieve and transfer the large information. Uh, now, many cases we have customers who are moving data through who are uh, uh, you know, moving large files, and those are done batch, those are done on triggers, those are done nightly, and obey the bandwidth constraints, the least cost routing algorithms that have been implemented. So IoT is not just this massive flood of data, it's a meaningful selected stream of data backed by massive information. Um, and I think when you see the, the large sensor networks and sensor clouds uh, that are coming online, those are not transferring, it's not they're transferring tons of information, it's simply that they're all connected and give you a much richer and more robust picture. Um, eventually, that does aggregate up and become big data. But I would not instantly um, correlate somebody saying I have IoT to them having a big data problem. And actually, a couple of years ago, I walked through the user base, this was at Exceda, I walked through our customers. And I said, okay, what's your volume? How many are you getting? What's the nature of the problems you're trying to solve? What are you trying to extract from the data? Um, and I encountered very few that would qualify as a big data use case. Big data meaning a data set larger than one can fit on a single disk. Okay. So uh, when you go out there and search, though, and you do, this is a Wordly. Um, I'm a big fan of Wordly. Uh, basically, you can just give it text, and it will go and crunch. We crunched a bunch of IoT articles, and then it showed us the distribution. We saw machine a lot. We saw machine to machine. We saw data as being the primary component. But we see some other things, um, the social aspect, the science aspect. What we noticed in the fact that people are physically working with this data we noticed that it was not just the remote service use case, uh, because those changed the paradigm of service for sure, but it was also changing the way that people were working and interacting with devices and machines. And so we have a new wave, a second you know, phase of customers that are focused specifically on changing the way things are done. On Farm, for example, uh, one of our customers, uh, they have uh, connected farm equipment, as you can imagine, uh, across multiple vendors. So they make their own tractors. These guys provide it from the farm owner's perspective, from the farm management perspective. This changes how they grow. This changes when they choose to plant. This changes when they water. Huge issue right now, certainly in the southwest, out in California as well. Uh, when you water, 
matters. You water at the wrong times, you have evaporation, and don't water wet soil. So uh, they contribute to increasing uh, crop yields, to maximizing the water distribution based on the amount that you have available to you. These sorts of changes are what is heralded by the next wave of IoT. Simple connect, get data and service, the foundation, that was the, that was the beachhead. That's how we started into the connected product space. Now we're seeing people are changing the way they actually go about doing business. Uh, Usage-based insurance, we have Modus as a customer uh, who feeds insurance their data. Um, now these guys are, uh, you know, big fans of the standardization, of course, using the OBD2 ports. Um, but they've built up a solution that uses um, our platform to track the devices, to roll up the data, and then forward it on so that it can be crunched by the actuaries and all the folks in the back end who calculate the insurance risk and their premium allocation. This is something where it changed the way you pay for something that you may not enjoy. It's not a service you want to pay for, but you have to. So it's changing a way of life, and it's allowing safe drivers, first of all, to be identified, but beyond that, to pay like they're safe drivers and risky drivers to pay like risky drivers, as opposed to distributing that risk across broad demographic groups, which was the approach that they took uh, up to this point. So an another game-changing or life-changing way of going about things. Um, also, with uh, traffic signs, in old school, you know, certainly these things have been done forever, um, slow down, speed limits, event parking, traditional old use cases, these things could be done by hand. Uh, what about an amber alert? What about an accident that just occurred? Um, you know, what about uh, a natural disaster, an imminent tornado warning? It's not enough to simply be able to uh, connect these devices to get data from. You need to reach out, you need to physically change it. Uh, so All Traffic Solutions, uh, one of our customers um, that also has a, a bit of a partner angle with us, um, these guys are doing fantastic jobs of helping to roll up traffic data, but better still, giving um, you know municipalities the ability to immediately reach out and update uh, in near real time, all of their signs to direct traffic flow, um, to try to ease any traffic concerns or allow people to respond to emergencies that occur in their area. Um, and then uh, finally, um, getting a... So this is a great story. These guys built these apps on their own. They did a fantastic job of it. Um, basically, they have... Uh, they manufacture autoclaves. So they manufacture these... Uh, or autoclaves. These devices that sterilize all the equipment that exists inside a hospital. High, high temperature stuff. Again, very precision, decent size CapEx equipment. But the problem was that things would get backed up. Things would... You know, they'd sit there and say, man, I'm running out of scalpels. Despite the fact that there are 80 scalpels waiting to be washed and three of the washers are currently empty. So what they needed to do was just bring the visibility. Nobody is sitting there watching the machine waiting for it to finish. That would be a horrible thing to be paying somebody a salary for. So what they did was they took the data, they connected the machines, they brought it up and now there's a display in their break area that tells them where everything is. Um, so this changed the way they work. Now you don't have somebody being sent down to the basement to wait for the autoclave to finish. Instead, it's part of your normal working environment. Highly optimized it, vastly increased the throughput and stop shortages, and actually allows hospital to carry less inventory because it's not sitting there dirty waiting to be cleaned up. So perfect story for not just connecting, but changing the way work is done for somebody. Um, so I'll roll into our customers a little bit. Um, we have 170, 180 customers, somewhere in that range, a uh, subset of who have been thrown up here, a lot of big folks, a um, lot of um, device man medical device manufacturers. You know, we have nine of the top ten medical device manufacturers using our solution, uh, AT&T, and we're signing on multiple additional telcos. Um, for the top five IT storage providers, think large disk arrays, using it for remotely servicing, monitoring, and in some cases providing um, value-added uh, proactive service offerings based on the technology. Uh, <clears throat> among the world's largest embedded software company with Intel and WinRiver, those guys are sponsoring our boot camp and our, our user conference coming up and we're using their devices in the hackathon. Uh, the top two American ATM manufacturers um, and of course the world's largest industrial uh, manufacturer in GE. So we are all over the place. IoT is happening. Um, it's happening in our customer base, it's happening in our ecosystem. So we have everything from solution providers to SIs uh, to MNOs 
um, a whole bunch of edge and embedded partners and business system partners, and this list is expanding on an almost daily basis as we reach out. And this is really the value of, of sitting as a cloud offering somewhat in the middle of IoT, facing the app guys, facing the device guys, facing the solution providers. It gives us a great perspective, not only of how the ecosystem is evolving, but gives us a chance to provide value through a whole horde of um, uh, additional uh, sales reps and additional um, uh, evangelists coming from those organizations. Uh, and we've started to roll these offerings up through our ThingWorks marketplace. It feels like an app store. Some things are not going to be as easy as an app store. Some things are drop in, install in your instance, and get running. Um, many of them are, are focused on supporting different devices. Uh, we support, I think, 26 device types now. Um, and we've got a backlog of more than 50. Um, allows you to rapidly get onboarded and rapidly start bringing IoT value. Uh, so the PPC world, and I'll, I'll try to um, hurry this up a bit because we're uh, running a bit short on time. Uh, from a PTC perspective, now ThingWorks is a subsidiary. It's a business unit within PTC. PTC views the world as uh, you know, a series of technology uh, problems for them to solve in order to transform the way you create, operate, and service products. Everything from CAD to product lifecycle management, asset lifecycle management, and now via ThingWorks, the IoT side. You're building a product, you're designing the product, you're operating the product, you should connect the product. Um, and that's how we have begun to shift toward a company focused on smart, connected products. A little different than IoT. The word thing doesn't appear there. The word internet doesn't appear there. And those are both deliberate omissions. Uh, so we define a smart connected product as any physical product. This could be, um, you know, we've got the, the standard appliances, planes, uh, vehicles, uh, medical equipment. Could be electrical or mechanical device. And then we start to add capabilities to that device. The ability to process the information coming from it, the ability to sense the environment in which it operates, the ability to tell it to do things or update its firmware or reboot because believe it or not, you know, we exposed um, as part of the Exceda platform, we exposed in the early days the capability for people to write um, sort of instructions to send down to a device. You want to guess what the number one instruction was for the first uh, instruction that they needed to deploy? Everybody put in reboot the thing. Um, to, you, no matter how complex the equipment, that nuclear option is still out there. Um, and then the ability to interact with it via an enhanced UI, more than just the UI of the support folks, but a UI even at the device side. Once you have that, you can start connecting these devices um, in systems, in systems of systems, which is what IoT promises us, um, and then aggregate that data up to the cloud of products around that device, uh, CRM systems to manage the uh, interactions between the customer and the vendor, um, the rules and analytics so that you can react and you can analyze and get deep dish information about what's running. So there's a whole bunch of technology and a whole bunch of facets to a smart connected product. And we use this term internally and externally simply because we think it defines our focus a little more cleanly than simply saying IoT. We certainly play in IoT, but we play in the smart connected product side of IoT, um, not necessarily in the, the social space or the pure technology space. So quickly looking at how our, our stack is put together, we have a whole bunch of software and hardware partners that exist at the edge. We do not manufacture hardware, uh, but we do create toolkits, agents, gateway servers um, that can be deployed in these devices that can use all kinds of network communications, uh, cell, Wi-Fi, uh, hardwired, satellite. We've integrated with basically everything you could do, Bluetooth and Zigbee. Uh, for uh, detecting devices. We manage the identity and security independent of the um, internal identity management or in addition to um, such as a device might have a serial number and a model number that it corresponds to. Um, so we go beyond that by providing our own and providing end-to-end -end security ranging from uh, trusted certs to carrying forward hardware root of trust from Wind River um, all the way toward using a proprietary uh, dedicated VPN between our data center and AT&T and Jasper. Um, on the wireless side. Um, and then all this comes up into the cloud where at the core of it we have uh, an aggregated database um, and then we begin to integrate out. We have rules we run internally. We have an app platform to build applications. We have a flexible service front end for you to build applications outside our platform. 
Um, and then we begin to integrate out with external information sources to bring context to the data we collect. Um, and then output uh, information to various business systems. Um, Salesforce is frequently asked for. Um, we have people using SAP. Um, Jasper, uh, not a business system, but we also have an integration there so you can manage the connectivity. So we sort of view the smart connected space as fit for uh, the technology stack we've put together. Uh, so now I will say that I have a bunch more slides, but uh, I also have a clock. Uh, so what I will do is try to wrap things up here in the next couple minutes and hopefully leave a little bit of runway uh, for a Q&A session. Okay, so um, obligatory pitch. Uh, we have our LiveWorks 15 conference happening in Boston. We have it in Boston every year. Um, it, it was formerly called Connection. Now we are LiveWorks. It is a much bigger, better, better event. Um, on the 4th through 7th, you'll have your traditional uh, conference activities, including... Um, keynotes by industry experts and Steve Wozniak uh, will be on stage awarding uh, prizes to our hackathon winners. The hackathon is May 2nd and 3rd in Boston. Um, I am running it and I urge you to attend. It will be a, a blast. We have a lot of local um, IoT startups that are going to uh, provide us with equipment um, such as uh, Smart Ag and Smart City um, and working with the Perkins School of the Blind for a fantastic um, internal navigation accessibility challenge. Um, for PDC, so the big roll-up, um, you know, right now is the time to act. There are a lot of players in this space. We certainly know where we fit in this space. Um, be wary of the sticker IoT folks who are now claiming IoT without having done it, um, and just check the pedigree to make sure they understand, because IoT is a lot more complicated than data updated down, um, and a lot of folks are just bringing that to the table now. All right, so with that, um, I would like to conclude uh, the presentation portion. And uh, are there folks out there who have any questions? Yeah, great. So uh, first off, um, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. So um, one of the questions that came in from the audience um, is, you know, if we uh, expect, how do we expect users to manage 500 million apps, right? If there's an app for everything. So this person said, I already struggle with finding the correct app on my phone. You know, if you add that 10x, you know, how, like, how am I, it's simply like a problem like my email inbox. So how do we address this problem with so many apps? Sure. All right, so I'd address it in two ways. Um, I would say that the IoT community has, um, you know, hundreds of millions and billions of potential users. So the 500 million apps is certainly not meant to say that you would have one for every possible application or every possible uh, use case that you possess. Um, so I'd say that the, the number impacting you would be less lessened. Um, on our side, we can provide data to whatever applications. We have both an application and a service front end. So knowing that we have the service front end, you, you can basically have one application to rule them all, provided you can get the commercial side to line up. Um, that's the primary challenge we face right now. Commercial things just don't align. Uh, the, the drivers for businesses to connect products differ from the drivers for a consumer of that data. Uh, they care about you know, uh, maintaining competitive advantage, uh, not leaking any intentional or internal IP. Um, so they're not concerned about whether you have to have an Electrolux, an LG, and a Whirlpool app on your phone to control your IoT devices. They're concerned that you bought an Electrolux device. Um, so I think it's going to take a little time to get to a point where we can sort of even that out. Um, and that'll be largely on the commercial and the standard side. But I would say that we are drifting toward a future where that 500 million apps is mostly transparent to you. The fact that you have one app that shows you four devices might tell you that in the back end there are four applications built with service front ends, not UIs, but service front ends that roll into your app. Right. Um, so another question um, that came in uh, from somebody was, you know, um, in your, in your great presentation, one of the things that you were kind of walking through was all these different uh, markets and applications, right? So whether it be the striker medical device or it be the GE engine. Um, from your perspective, uh, this person would like to know, you know, similar to the last panel where we asked this, um, I think that's probably where they saw this, is, you know, what markets from your perspective do you see really gaining adoption with IoT platforms and, and connected devices and things like that? Okay. So it, the ones that have already adopted it are the big equipment manufacturers. Um, in terms of the, the big emerging markets, uh, I would hit you mainly with smart agriculture, um, and I would hit you with the uh, connected home, the smart home world. 
So on the smart agriculture front, um, more less water, um, that pair of drivers is sufficient to say, okay, we're going to need to get better at growing, we're going to get better at crop management, at field and resource management, and the way that we're going to go about doing this is through technology. Um, there's no massive new invention likely uh, for generating water, desalinating water, um, what we're going to do instead, you know, uh, look at the folks who are helping us with our hackathon, freight farms um, out of Needham, Mass. They have um, a farm that is built inside a shipping container that takes 90% less water than traditional method. And when we have 90% less water, that's a compelling story. Um, and it basically writes itself in terms of the uh, ROI. Um, you know, we have water as ubiquitous utility right now. You don't think about it, you turn on the faucet. Um, if there were a meter attached to that when you turned on the faucet, you would know it. You would think, you know, twice about the way you used it. So I think that the oncoming resource shortages that we face, um, of course, with the climate change affecting as well, um, I think that smart ag becomes gigantic. I also think that uh, the distributed agriculture, so not just the massive farms out west, they're tapping aquifers and won't always be full took them hundreds of thousands or at least tens of thousands to fill up, and we're depleting them as fast as we can. Um, so I think agriculture is going to redistribute, and if I were to, to put a stake in it and say what market to go into, um, outside of the, the uh, OEMs, the connected product manufacturers, I would go with Smart Ag. Great. That's, that's very, very helpful. And uh, so with that being said, uh, you know, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. And again, thank you very much for a wonderful keynote. Uh, we really appreciate it. And again, everyone, if you get the chance, please take a look and see if you can visit uh, LiveWorks uh, May 4th through the 7th. Um, it's a great event. I was there last year. And, uh, you know, honestly, I, I, I was impressed because um, there was uh, so many uh, just, you know, wonderful speakers talking about specific use cases. So whether it be on farm or whether it be, um, you know, looking in the industrial space, uh, just a wonderful array of, of, you know, real use cases and real implementations of IoT technologies that I think really helped uh, drive adoption and, and knowledge. So thanks again, and uh, we look forward to participating here with you in the future.